The year is 2050, and the world is more polluted, unequal, and dangerous than ever before. Megacities from New Delhi, Lagos, Mexico City face suffocating smog. Over a billion people around the world lack access to reliable electricity, and climate change is serving up droughts, floods, and heat waves with alarming regularity. Much of the disastrous state of the world is due to the solar power revolution sputtering out. See, way back in 2020, solar power had already become the cheapest source of electricity on the planet. From Chile to China, solar farms sprouted more than any other kind of power plant. New homes came with sleek solar roofs. And in the developing world, standalone solar systems offered villagers their first taste of electricity. And yet, sometime in the 2030s, the once unstoppable momentum of solar power hit a screeching halt. Today, at the mid-century mark, fossil fuels exert a stranglehold on the global economy. Coal and natural gas are still burned to produce a majority of the world's electricity and run its factories. Oil runs most of the world's cars and trucks and nearly every single ship and plane, further polluting the air. You know, we thought that the rising popularity of electric vehicles might actually reduce air pollution. And yet, over a billion petroleum-fueled vehicles still share the roads with electric ones. And the supposedly clean electric vehicles cause substantial air pollution every time they charge up with the electricity generated by fossil fuels. Scientists tell us it's only going to get worse. Already, droughts from Africa to the Middle East have left hundreds of millions in a persistent state of water scarcity and famine. And rising sea levels have spurred waves of mass migration from the floodplains of Bangladesh. But this is just the beginning. Before the end of the century, Miami and New Orleans will be underwater. New York will be the new Bahrain of heat waves. For climate change is speeding up. The white ice sheets at the globe's poles have largely melted, leaving behind darker ocean water that reflects less sunlight and heats the Earth's surface even faster. And vast stores of greenhouse gases, once trapped in the permafrost that since melted, are escaping into the atmosphere from Siberia and the bottom of the ocean. Like a runaway train, the changing climate can't be stopped. Not today, not for 10,000 years. This vision of 2050 is what the world is headed toward. And it's terrifying. But in my new book, Taming the Sun, I lay out a roadmap for a brighter future. Yes, I argue that solar power today is on track to sputter out. But with urgent investments in innovation from governments around the world, solar could actually break through the ceiling that it's currently headed for and achieve its sky-high potential. Because every hour, the sun beams down more energy than the world uses in an entire year. The problem is that it's really inconvenient to tap into this energy source. Look, sunlight varies widely depending on what time of day it is or what season it is. In some places, it scorches the terrain. In others, it hides behind the clouds. It's diffuse all over. It'll take human ingenuity to tame this troublesome energy source. Familiar silicon solar panels have recently made dramatic strides. They've fallen in cost, and they've advanced by increasing their investment. More investment went into solar last year than any other power source on the planet. So you might think, hey, if solar keeps falling in cost, widening its competitive advantage over fossil fuels, well, then surely its growth will continue unabated, right? Wrong. And to see why, let's look at California. See, California is a state where solar already meets most of the state's or many of the state's power needs at lunchtime. Here's an example of a spring day last year, where in the middle of the day, around noon, when the sun was right overhead, solar was meeting most of that state's electricity needs. That sent the price of power in the bottom graph plunging below zero. The power markets were literally paying you to turn off your power plant. But then as the sun set, wiping out solar output, the price spiked reflecting the high value of power at dinner time, not lunchtime. Well, the next solar panel is only going to give you lunchtime power, reflecting the dwindling value of solar. The more of it you have, the less valuable it becomes. And the swiftly eroding value of solar could well undercut 
the gently declining cost, halting its momentum and reducing its economics to none. What are we going to do about this? Well, unfortunately, it looks like solar's rise could stall on current course and speed. Around the world, countries are failing to proactively invest in the power grids needed to accommodate the rising share of intermittent solar power. India, for example, is struggling to connect its sun-drenched deserts with its energy-hungry cities. In Europe, we've already seen solar begin to saturate as some of the early adopters roll back their public incentives. Around the world, if we see a slowdown, solar could fail to follow an exponential hockey stick, instead following a logistic S-curve and hitting a ceiling. We've seen this movie before. Once upon a time, nuclear energy was the great hope for clean, abundant energy for all. And then, nuclear, after a building boom for two decades, peaked and never came back. Solar power today, at 2% of global electricity, is right where nuclear was in the 1970s. It could have a decade or even two of growth, and then it too could hit a ceiling, unless we act now. That's why I argue it'll take three kinds of innovation for solar to avoid hitting that ceiling. The first kind of innovation, financial innovation, is one that I'm relatively optimistic about, even if governments do not make many investments right now. See, even though familiar silicon solar panels might hit a limit decades down the line, there's plenty of progress to be made right now. With financial innovation, we're going to be able to source the trillions of dollars of capital needed to continue solar's rise in the near term. See, Bloomberg forecasts a shortfall of $2.5 trillion in that top graph, above what investors are currently willing to pay for solar. To plug that gap, the bottom chart tells you that the biggest, most deep-pocketed investors, institutional investors, could provide enough investment to meet that $2.5 trillion shortfall. But they need to be comfortable investing in solar. They currently invest in the auto, mortgage, and oil and gas industries because you can bundle together assets into a diversified portfolio. I'm confident that the industry will come up with the innovations to enable those investors to do the same for solar projects. And it won't just be the developed world. In the developing world, you'll also see financial and business model innovation. Around the world, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia in particular, you see energy poverty, over a billion people who lack any access to electricity. Business model innovation, though, pioneered by entrepreneurs and startups, is bringing electricity to many folks for the first time. Here's how such a model might work, the pay-as-you-go system. A customer gets a solar system installed largely for free and then pays monthly payments using mobile money. The firm manages to raise the capital for the upfront cost on public financial markets, and then the customer ultimately pays off that solar installation through monthly payments and has a valuable asset to his or her name so that she can then raise credit. That's a hugely economically empowering concept. Still. Financial innovation alone is not going to prevent solar from hitting its limits. Existing technology will hit that ceiling. That's why technological innovation is paramount. Around the world, in laboratories, researchers have developed breakthrough technologies. Here's one of them. It's known as perovskite solar power. I used to work on this technology as a researcher at Oxford University under Dr. Henry Snaith, a pioneer in the field. Perovskites could one day enable colorful, transparent, flexible, highly efficient, and dirt cheap solar coatings. They could be ubiquitous. You could see them on skyscrapers, all over cityscapes. Still though, they would only instantaneously convert sunlight into electricity. So it would be really cool if we could convert sunlight, harness it, and produce portable fuels. Well, there is a technology that does that. It's known as artificial leaf technology, and already in laboratories at small scales, it does 10 times better than natural plants do photosynthesis. If we had artificial fuels at scale, we could then take solar energy, split water, and produce hydrogen fuel. That hydrogen could then combine with carbon dioxide off of a smokestack, and it could produce carbon-containing liquid drop-in replacements that compete head-to-head -head with petroleum. You know, I see in the future solar refineries not oil refineries, that serve a range of needs from industry to transportation. Finally, the third kind of innovation we need is systemic to continue solar's rise. That involves reimagining energy systems so that solar energy can be most productively used and stored no matter when it's produced or how much it fluctuates. One way to do this is to build continent-spanning grids. Now, China wants to build a supergrid all over the world because it realizes that the sun is always shining somewhere. 
Now, that may not be feasible, but regional supergrids are indeed feasible and promising. In addition to being large, smarter grids can enable consumers to adjust their electricity demand on the fly to line up with the availability of solar electricity. Now, the most intuitive way that you were probably thinking about in order to buffer the intermittency of solar is batteries. Here's a flashy Tesla battery installation out in the field. But let me tell you, if you relied only on batteries to buffer solar's enormous volatility, it would be prohibitively expensive. That's why it'll take a diverse range of low carbon electricity resources in order to buffer solar's intermittency. Now, if you link the electricity system to other systems, heat, desalination, transportation, you add more flexible and productive uses of energy to accommodate the rising share of unpredictable solar. Here's an example. Electric vehicle fleets could be intelligently dispatched so that they charge up only when solar energy is available on the grid and then discharge when they need to help the grid supply energy when the sun goes down. That could be a powerful concept. Now all of this is going to take innovation. And I argue that the United States could be a leader in enabling solar power to continue growing and be a shining example for the rest of the world for how this works. Yet, China is on track to replace the United States as the leading funder of energy innovation by 2020. And unfortunately, President Trump's budget request would slash renewable energy research and development funding by two thirds. That would be a catastrophic blunder. On the contrary, I urge the United States to increase its funding for technological innovation and also to fund systemic innovation, upgrading its infrastructure, reforming its energy markets so that we can in fact serve as that shining example. Now, if all of this happens, let me lay out a brighter future for the world. The year is 2050. And even though it faces grave challenges, the world is in control of its own destiny. Nightmare scenarios of economic and humanitarian catastrophe are off the table. Solar power is the linchpin of a clean energy revolution that's kept climate change at bay and it's lifted the world's destitute out of darkness. For the first time in history, fossil fuels are on the wane. Now let me tell you, Today's solar technologies barely resemble those quaint silicon solar panels manufactured by China in the opening decades of the 21st century. By 2030, industrial printers were, printing out, were churning out rolls of solar coatings in a range of colors and transparencies. A decade later, it was cheaper to solar coat your house than to paint it. And solar technologies also allowed us to store the sun's energy in the form of portable fuels. So today, petroleum-fueled electric vehicles are a distant third place choice behind uh, hydrogen and electric vehicles. That means that even though urban denizens complain of ever-increasing congestion, local air pollution peaked in 2040 and it's declined ever since. This panoply of fascinating solar technologies is the result of far-sighted technology bets made by the United States over three decades ago. And because of that, we've profited handsomely. You know, back in 2013, the US replaced Saudi Arabia as the world's largest producer of oil. 20 years later, it dethroned China as the world's largest producer of solar products, the combined market value for which exceeds that for oil today. Now, to cope with the massive fluctuations of solar power on the grid, countries have invested in continent-spanning power grids not only are grids bigger, they're smarter. They send signals to batteries and billions of internet connected devices to adjust their electricity on the fly to adjust to electricity supply. Few would dispute that solar energy is one of the most important advances of the 21st century, maybe even the most important, for it may not have ensured victory against global challenges such as climate change, but taming the sun sure did give the world a fighting chance. Thanks so much.